in this video we're going to continue our discussion of Shure systems and we're actually going to derive what is known as the Shure estimator which is a type of GLS estimator. So just to recap we had our Shure system which I've indicated up here where we've got a dependent variable y which has got dimensions n t by 1 because what we've actually done is we've stacked all the dependent variables on top of one another in a row vector and then we've also kind of stacked the independent variables in a matrix. And if you're unsure about any of this, please refer back to a previous video. And we also went through in the last video and we actually calculated the variance of the error term, the variance of epsilon given that we have our matrix of independent variables x. And we actually found that this was equal to the Kronecker product of our matrix omega with the identity matrix of dimensions t by t. And the matrix omega is actually given over here on the left. It's essentially just the correlation between the errors between different individuals or the contemporaneous correlation between individuals' errors or different individuals' errors. And we can think about this entire matrix as being represented by a sort of larger matrix sigma, which has dimensions nt by nt. And just to recap, remember that this matrix sigma isn't going to be diagonal. So that means that OLS estimators are no longer going to be blue. They're no longer going to be the best linear unbiased estimator. There are other estimators of which GLS is the best, which is actually better than OLS. So we're in this video going to derive the GLS estimator for sure systems which is sort of abbreviated as the Sure Estimator. Okay, so as with all GLS estimators, essentially what we do is we take some sort of linear transformation of both sides of our system. So we multiply the dependent variable by some sort of unspecified matrix P, which we're actually going to derive in this video. And then we have to do the same to the right-hand side. So that's P X beta plus P times epsilon. And at this point, it becomes prudent to define some other variables such that we can write our system a little bit more compactly. So if I define a new dependent variable z, which is equal to p times y, if I define, or if I define rather a new matrix of independent variables omega, which is equal to p times x, and then finally, if I define a new error, let's call it u, which is equal to p times epsilon which means that we can translate our system into much simpler form, which is z is equal to omega times beta plus u. Okay, so let's leave that behind for a second and let's just work ahead with what we had originally. We're gonna come back to this in a second. So if we look at this transform system, we can calculate the variance of the transformed error. The variance of the transformed error is essentially the variance of this matrix P, which we haven't defined yet, times the error epsilon, given that we have x. And because we've assumed that the zero conditional mean assumption is upheld, this is the same thing as p times the expectation of epsilon times epsilon prime, given that we have x times the transpose of p. And we know that this term inside the parenthesis here really is just the variance of epsilon. So actually, I could have just written the variance of epsilon there. Perhaps that's a little bit too much notation. So this is just going to be P times the variance of epsilon given X, which is just this matrix, which I've defined over here as capital sigma. So this is just P times capital sigma times the transpose of P. And remember what we're trying to do in taking this transformation. Essentially, what we're trying to do is make our transformed error essentially have a variance covariance structure which is diagonal and I can say that this transform variance or the variance of the transform system should hence be equal to the identity matrix where the identity matrix now has dimensions nt by nt. So as we did before it's very easy then to calculate sigma in terms of our matrices p and p prime. And it turns out that sigma is actually equal to p primed times p all to the power minus one. And then if we require that p is a symmetric matrix, that means that we can actually derive the matrix p. It's just equal to sigma to the power minus a half. 
and that should come as no great surprise. Essentially, this is exactly the same result as we got for just ordinary GLS. And essentially, there's no change here. We're just dealing with slightly bigger matrices. In the next video, we're going to use this matrix P to help us derive the form of the Schur estimator.